go through the letter as, as in a chunk. So why two Thessalonians though? Well, actually, as I was preparing and reading it, I thought it's very relevant for the church where it is today, in particularly the Church of England. And I believe it is just as important to the Church of England in 2024 as it was when Paul first wrote it to the church in Thessalonica all those years ago. I hadn't factored in when I prepared it that obviously General Synod are meeting this weekend, which sort of makes it even more relevant than before, I think. But these two letters to the church in Thessalonica contain four of the most important New Testament passages about the end times, or the posh word is the eschatological times, the culmination of all things. You don't need to remember that word. I was told never use it in a sermon, but there we go, I just have done. In particular, though, in this letter, we have the coming of Christ in 2 Thessalonians 1, the previous appearance of the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2, and the responsibility of Christians in 2 Thessalonians 3. So it's a good three-point letter to go through, which makes us good Anglicans. We've got to be good at something in Anglicanism. And I'm actually going to look at three points on chapter one as well. And as I was preparing, I had Adrian Plass in my head. You know, all good sermons start with three points, which are then subdivided into three further points, subdivided into three further points, which are then divided into three further points. You'll be pleased to know I've only got three points. Hmm. Anyway, what we need to bear in mind, though, as we begin this look at this letter is that Paul did not write this as a theological document. He did not write it for people to be saying, well, this is a theology of Paul. No. As with his other letters, it's an ad hoc document that is written to a church in a local place at a dealing with specific circumstances. So it's worth bearing that in mind as we begin looking through this. There is an issue over groups of people disturbing the peace in the church in Thessalonica, which is why Paul is writing. We hear some of this in the first letter. There are the persecutors of the church. We hear, if we read 1 Thessalonians, of the opposition that the church was having to endure. Then there are false teachers, the group of people that seem to have been responsible for circulating a forged document from Paul which essentially said that the day of the Lord had already come. Chapter 2 is reminding the church that they must stand firm in the teaching that has already been received. And lastly, there were the idlers. We meet them in the first letter, but in chapter 3, they become clearer. They're people who ignore the teaching of Paul. As I looked at those three people, I thought, well, that's the church today. There are those that persecute the church. There are those that try and preach false doctrine in the church. And there are are those that simply ignore the teaching of the church. However, it would be a mistake if we were to think of those three groups of people as the reason for this letter. Because actually what Paul is doing through his letter is he's turning those negative situations into a positive advantage. He focuses on when the wrongs will be made right, when Christ's judgment and salvation will be complete, and reminding the church then and now that we have a responsibility to live according to the teaching of Christ. That is a message that the church, particularly the Church of England, and our bishops particularly, need to hear right now, that they are supposed to be leading the church according to the teaching of Jesus Christ. You could say that this letter has been written to the church today, and if it was, it would be sent straight to our bishops. The church is being persecuted Quite literally in some parts of the world where our brothers and sisters risk their lives by saying Jesus is Lord. But then more subtly in our Western culture, where the church is seen as more and more exclusive, it's seen as an institution that's lost its way and an institution that's out of touch with this world. 
That's how the church is viewed. That's not what the church should be, and it's not what the church should represent. The church should be speaking into the world, telling the world about Jesus Christ, so that people come to know him, and we can get rid of all this stupid secularism that's creeping in into our church. It's about time the church woke up. There are, of course, the false teachers within the church. There are the false teachers out in society. And there are those that simply ignore the way of Christ, even in the church, and try and run the church the way that they think it should be run. Is it any wonder our church is in such a mess at the moment? So let's dive into chapter 1 as we explore what Paul has been saying. As with any good letter, it begins with a greeting, almost identical to the words in his first letter. Paul, Silas, and Timothy are well known in Thessalonica because they were the three that helped in the original evangelization of that city. So they know them. So those names will mean something to the hearers. The church is described in much the same way as it was as in 1 Thessalonians. And the NIV then splits the rest of the chapter into three paragraphs, and we're going to explore those three paragraphs. Firstly, in verses 3 and 4, Paul is given a thanksgiving for God's grace. It's really, really important in our faith. We need to get into the habit of thanking God for his blessing. How often do we actually thank God for all that he has given us? How often do we thank God for the blessings he's given us? We're very good at saying, God, will you help with this? And when he answers that prayer, how good are we actually going back and saying, thank you, Lord? Probably not very good. That's not to make you feel bad. But both letters to the church in Thessalonica begin with a thanksgiving for the blessing that God has given. We often give thanks, but we swiftly move on to the next step of, but that still isn't right. This isn't right. And then when we've got that blessing, we start then comparing ourselves with us, going, well, we've got a blessing here because something's happening in this church, but that church, wonder what's going on there. Or if you're in that church, you start comparing yourself, going, well, why is it all going wrong for us, and yet it's going right for them? When you strip all of that away, if you look at the churches, it's the churches that are following Jesus Christ that are growing, it's the churches with the false teachers that are moving away and that are dying. Within the church, though, we sometimes start comparing ourselves. Well, they've got a better faith than me. I wish I had their faith. They've got it all sorted. Well, guess what? Nobody's got it sorted. That way of thinking, though, puts us into the mindset that faith is static. It's either something you have or it's something you have not. Paul talks in verse 3 that the church's faith is growing more and more, and the love they each have is increasing. Therefore, it is not static. It is something that can be grown, something that can be increased. Paul attributes it to God's grace. If we were to look back to 1 Thessalonians 3.12 and 4.10, we see that Paul prays that their love would grow. And this mention in verse 3 shows that that prayer is being answered. We can't just take this letter in isolation. We have to look at it with the first letter as well. So the church in Thessalonica has clearly grown between letter one and letter two. So much so that even with the false teachers and those that persecuted the church, Paul is able to say that among the churches they can boast about the perseverance and faith that the church had. I wonder if the same could be said for the church today? Could we boast about the faith and perseverance that the church has today? Is that what we're known for? Or are we known as an outdated institution which is more concerned with preserving historic buildings and satisfying the Victorian society rather than preaching the good news in our communities? I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I, had an email, I get an email every day with sort of updates on what's happening in the church. And at the top... Church sells pews without permission. For goodness sake. It doesn't matter. The church isn't about the pews or the building. 
The church is about us all living together as a family of Jesus Christ. That's what it should be saying. What the headline should be saying is, church is reaching out to the community. Forget the pews. Get rid of them. Get rid of the buildings. Because the buildings hold us back. And we are too caught up in the Church of England on thinking, it's all about the building. Isn't it wonderful? We've got this old building. Oh, but we need to get permission for that one screw because we want to put a new picture up. It's pathetic. The Church of England has gone so, so wrong. It's about time we woke up. And it's about time we started following Jesus Christ. I read an article this week as well that basically said the church is so out of touch with the nation and the needs of the people, it is only going to get back by a miracle of God. And sadly, sadly I weep because I think that's true. It is only going to be rectified by God intervening. But if we also look at the teaching of Jesus, he implies that there are different levels of faith too. To some, he says, oh, you have little faith. To others, he says, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. And it's similar with love. We assume that we either love someone or we don't. But both faith and love need steps to nurture them as they are both a living relationship. Faith is that relationship of trust in God. And love is a living relationship as well with one another with our nearest and our dearest, with our church, with God. So what Paul is doing in these two verses is giving thanks to God for the grace that is clearly at work in the church. The church is doing well because people have faith, they love each other, and it is growing. Therefore, we know God must be at work. Can the same be said today? I don't think it can. We look at the church and we see a divided church on so many matters. Rather than love for one another, we try to get one up on each other. Rather than increasing our faith, we put more and more emphasis on ourselves and how successful we are, rather than thinking, actually, this is what God is doing. It all leads towards breakdown. And if you remember last year, we looked, we had that series, When Church Stops Working. And I think church has stopped working. I often wondered, if Paul was to write to the Church of England, what would he say? Honestly, I'm not sure I'd want to read it because it'd be too flipping hard. He would tear us apart because we are so focused on the wrong thing. When was the last time we heard the church talking about Jesus Christ? It's all about sexuality at the moment. And then when that's sorted, it'll be all about something else. When do we hear the church talking about God intervening in the world and helping those in need? When do we hear about the signs and wonders that God is performing in the here and the now? We don't. Because it doesn't sell newspapers. What sells newspapers is church fighting. Bishops at war with clergy. Etc. I wonder though, friends, if this is a wake-up call to the church, to start developing a new way in the church where we don't pick at each other, we don't fight with one another, not literally, I, ha I hasten to add, that happened in the early church, but we affirm and encourage each other. We encourage people who are doing well in their discipleship. We say, well done. And those who are struggling, we come alongside them and say, well, how can we help you in your discipleship at this moment? Because it's by the grace of God that we are going to continue on that journey. The second paragraph, verses 5 to 10, Paul gives a defense of God's justice. So we discover that Paul sees not only evidence of God's grace in the life of the church, but he sees evidence of God's righteous judgment. And it's likely that this comes about through the suffering that the church is experiencing, as well as the faith, the love, and the endurance that they are displaying during that suffering. So what we can establish from this is that Paul and Jesus have taught that suffering is unavoidable. It is unavoidable in this life. 
But that's the bad news. The good news is that through that suffering, we are being prepared for the kingdom of God. Romans 8, 17, Paul tells us we share in Christ's sufferings, so we will ever share in his glory. So if we look at the situation that's occurring, persecution of the church, it's clear that God is on the side of the church, sustaining and sanctifying them. And the persecutions that they're going through was a means to develop that love, faith, and perseverance even more, which was in direct contrast to the persecutors' prejudice, anger, and bitterness. So if we apply this to the modern day, perhaps it is no coincidence that where churches are persecuted, they are the ones that are growing rapidly. In China, in Iran, places where, where they are, people are killed for their faith, that's where the church is growing. That's where we're seeing hundreds of people come to know the Lord Jesus. Perhaps it's no coincidence that it's often after a big fallout in the church that revival comes. Perhaps it's because through the suffering, God is preparing those people of, uh, his people to be prepared for what is to come. And that those who are persecuting will eventually receive the judgment of God. Perhaps everything going on in the church at the moment is to wake us up. Is to shake us up and go, everything's gone wrong because you've relied on yourself. I'm going to now intervene and sort you all out. I'm going to shake you up and sort you out. And boy, does it need that. We have to be spiritually aware to see the injustice and what is happening. When on the face of it, it looks like malice, cruelty, power, and arrogance of those who persecute, and yet the people of God are opposed, ridiculed, boycotted, harassed, imprisoned, tortured, or killed. It seems the wrong way round. We complain, God, why don't you do something? But Paul's telling us, actually, God is already doing something. God is with those people who are persecuted. He's with the suffering because he is helping to prepare them for what is to come, whether that's in this life or in his kingdom. But it is, I acknowledge, a tough one to get your head around, particularly if you're in the middle of that summer, if something is going horribly wrong, and you think, God, where are you? Well, actually, that's where God is right beside you. Holding you, carrying you, preparing you for something new, something which will be wonderful. Because all good gifts come from God, as we hear in James. That then moves us into looking towards the coming judgment. Paul tells us that Jesus' return will be personal and glorious. Paul talks of the blazing fire in verse 7, which we know is an often used symbol of the holy consuming nature of God's presence. Paul then gives us an understanding of who will be punished. Not only those who do not know God, but those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus in verse 8. Now, interestingly, the word punishment could be interpreted many ways. But Paul is telling us that the destruction they face will be eternal separation from God. If we cast our minds to Calvary, we can get a glimpse of what separation from God looks like. If we think of Jesus on the cross, when he cries out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We see a little glimpse of what it's like to experience separation from God. I don't want that to be my eternity. I want my eternity to be in his presence, shining with glory. Because he has prepared me in this life for all that is to come in the next. Paul tells us what it's like for those of us who have knowledge of God and who have believed in verse 10. We not only see Christ's glory, but we will share in it. If we look to the transfiguration, when Jesus is glorified in his physical body, it's an indication of what it will be like for his spiritual body, the church. And of course, the church here does not mean our old buildings. It does not mean our pews. It means the people of God. The body of Christ being transfigured for eternity. There is a heck of a lot more to unpack here, but I just haven't the time to do it justice. But I do believe, if we are to take this word seriously, 
It is a warning to the church in the 21st century to hold on to the teachings of Christ, to hold on to the gospel so that we don't face being shut out from the presence of God. It's an encouragement that when we are suffering, it's because we're being prepared for future glory. And it's a reminder that God is just and that those who persecute us will eventually face God's judgment. He will make things right in his time, not necessarily ours. And lastly, verses 11 to 12, is a prayer for God's power. The future of God's people is secure. We know that. But Paul doesn't presume it. He's essentially telling us that the prospect of the kingdom of God means that there needs to be an incentive, is an incentive to pursue holiness now, which leads him to prayer, a good place to start. It's the prayer that links the future to the present. Paul is praying for us to be counted worthy of the calling we have received from God. That's important to consider for a moment. Because when we come to know the Lord Jesus, we know that we begin a lifelong journey towards holiness as much as the human condition allows. God is working in us and through us to narrow the gap between where we were when we gave our life to him and where we will ultimately be when we are with him for eternity. So Paul prays for purpose and for faith. And they are both attitudes of the mind and the heart. He prays that God will fulfill them by his power. That needs to be our prayer for today's church. That the church is filled with faith. Because boy is it lacking in the church. If we don't know our purpose and we don't have faith, what on earth are we doing? We're essentially failing as the church. It isn't very often when perhaps we actually pray for faith, but it is a gift. When was the last time you said to the Lord, Lord, increase my faith? For me, I don't even know. Perhaps we need to start praying for more faith, and then we'll see the church revitalized, revived, and ready for action as God intended it to be. But ultimately, Paul is reminding the church That when by God's power, God's people live a life worthy of that call, issues will be resolved in goodness and faith. And then Jesus is seen and honored, which leads us to being seen as a true human in the image of God. General Synod need to hear that, folks. Bishop Stephen Croft needs to hear that. He sent an appalling letter. I read that letter and thought, that's one, mate, you should have written, slept on, woken up the following morning, deleted it, and rewritten it. For those of you that don't know, he was responding to a letter from the Alliance about everything going on at Synod at the moment. Issues need to be resolved in goodness and faith, yet at the moment, the church seems to be at war. And it saddens me that that is where we've got to in 2024. Why are we not just following the call of Jesus and following him? Because if we were to follow him, get rid of the fact that we're Anglican or Church of England and the way we do it, but just follow Jesus. We're Christians at the end of the day. That should be our first definition of ourselves. Not Anglican, not Church of England, not man, not woman, not husband, not father, not mother, not sister, not daughter, not brother. No, your first identity is as a Christian. So where does it leave us? As a church, we've got to get better at reflecting Jesus Christ. As a church, we've got to make sure that we are holding firm to the gospel and not being swayed by the world. It means that we will face suffering, but it's to prepare us for the coming kingdom of God and all that lies ahead. I think that means the church needs to wake up. So let me ask you this. Are you ready to wake up as the army of Christ, are we happy to continue in our slumber? Amen.